so again, good morning. My name is Matt Osterkamp, and I'm here to introduce to you our first panel of the day, which is coming to us from the Chicago Public Library. And the panel is entitled, Won't You Be Our Neighbor? Community Research at Chicago Public Library. So as we put that slide up, presenting today is going to be Michelle McCoy from the Chicago Public Library, Allison Smalley, and Beth Locke, also from the Chicago Public Library. So it's my pleasure to, at this point, turn us over to Beth, who's going to get us started. So Beth, you can take it away. Thanks, Matt. Um, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, for your first uh, presentation today. It's titled, uh, Won't You Be Our Neighbors? Community Research at the Chicago Public Library. And can I just please get a quick thumbs up? Can everybody see my screen sharing that title slide? Excellent, thank you. Wanna make sure we're all starting on the same page. So um, as Matt said, my name is Beth Locke. I'm an archivist at the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection of Afro-American History and Literature. This is one of three archival repositories at Chicago Public Library. The library's archives and special collections division also consists of the Northside Neighborhood History Collection at Conrad Sulzer Regional Library, Special Collections at Harold Washington Library Center, and the library's exhibits department. Today's panel presentation begins with archivist Allison Smalley talking about three collections featured in the Summertime Joy in Chicago exhibit held at Sulzer Regional Library. She will also discuss how the Northside Neighborhood History Collection hopes to pursue community partnerships to document more <laughs> of the Northside's diversity. Then archivist Michelle McCoy will present an overview of the neighborhood collections held at Special Collections, emphasizing how these collections record community change over time. Finally, I'll talk about the Harsh Research Collections uh, that document the institution and the residents of Chicago's Brownsville neighborhood from the Great Migration through the Chicago Black Renaissance. We'll have plenty of time for questions and comments at the end. And as Matt mentioned, please go ahead and put your comments in the chat box. Thanks. Go right ahead, Allison, whenever you're ready. All right, thanks, Beth. So as Beth said, I'm Allison. I'm the archival specialist at the Northside Neighborhood History Collection at Chicago Public Library, Soldier Regional Library. And we're located in the Lincoln Square neighborhood on Chicago's North Side. Next slide, please. Sorry, it's already seems to be okay. <laughs> Here, let me go back to the beginning quick. Sorry about that. It's okay. Hmm. It is still stuck on my end, hmm. having trouble escaping it. Okay, here we go, sorry. Perfect, thank you. All right, so today I'll give a brief introduction to the NNHC. I'll tell you a little bit about a few of our collections and then discuss some of our plans for the future. And after Beth and Michelle have also spoken, I'd be really glad to answer any questions that you have. Next slide, please. So the Northside Neighborhood History Collection, as Beth said, is one of three archives and special collections units at the locations at the Chicago Public Library. We have two full-time staff members, one librarian and one archivist, and our focus is on local and neighborhood history. We work with a wide range of patrons, but many of them are local people researching the history of their family or their home. We also work with students, with historians, with journalists, and with local businesses and organizations. Before COVID, we had walk-in hours, but now we're open by appointment, although we also help many of our patrons by phone or email. And perhaps because we are a smaller neighborhood collection, we get a lot of beginning researchers. So we're always really happy to meet people where they are and to help them through the research process whether that means using our collections here at the NNHC or searching electronic resource resources that CPL subscribes to, such as Ancestry.com or the Historic Chicago Tribune. I know for me, helping our patrons and connecting people to information they value is really the highlight of my job. Next slide, please. So 
So the origins of the NNHD's collections are in the 1930s, and that was when Hild Regional Library opened, and that was the regional library on the north side before Solzer. It opened in 1931, and shortly after that, librarians led by Helen Zatterberg began reaching out to local community members to ask for donations of items that would create a collection that would document the area's history. And that's what our current collections are built on, the one that began in the 30s. Next slide, please. So the original librarians really focused on the neighborhoods surrounding the library, such as the Lincoln Square and Ravenswood. And the majority of our collections do still focus on these areas. But we do have smaller amounts from other north side neighborhoods and community areas. And we're also very interested in expanding our collection to document more of the north side. Next slide, please. So I did want to mention that we're lucky at the NNHC that many of our photographs are digitized and available on CPL's website and also through the Explore Chicago Collections portal. And this is partly possible because we have a smaller collection, so we're able to digitize more of our images. And not only are they digitized, but they're tagged with neighborhoods and streets and subject terms, which can be a big help when exploring the collection or narrowing down a topic. So I'd encourage everyone to check out chipublib.org slash digital collections and look at our stuff there. But we do, of course, have many photos that are not digitized and almost none of our manuscript material is. So of course, it's always best to reach out if you're looking for something and cannot find it. Next slide, please. So now I'll get a little more specific about our holdings here at the NNHC. We had a great exhibit this summer at Solzner that highlighted summertime joy in Chicago. And it's actually still up if you're able to come by and check it out. Um, it made use of two of our larger and more fre frequently used collections, the Ravenswood Lakeview Community Collection and the Robert W. Kruger Photograph Collection. And then also one of our smaller neighborhood archives, the Portage Park Community Collection. And I think these three collections give a good idea of the kind of material we have at the NNHC. So I'll tell you a little bit about each of them today. Next slide, please. So first, the Ravenswood Lakeview Community Collection. It has both photographs and manuscript material. And it covers subjects such as local families, businesses, schools, parks, and religious institutions. It's definitely what archivists would call an artificial collection. It was brought together by librarians and donated in bits and pieces over the years, rather than being generated in the course of day-to-day -day business of an organization or a person's life. The focus is on the late 19th and the first half of the 20th century, but there's a little bit of more modern material also. Many of the photos that I've used so far in this presentation come from the collection and the manuscript material includes things like news clippings, as well as letters, programs, tickets, newsletters, advertisement, political campaign material, and other ephemera. You can definitely find plenty of interesting and unexpected items. I've included a few of them here, like this card from a local woman running to be elected judge in 1914 a letter from a young man at the front during the First World War, and a receipt from an art lesson in 1887. I think the Ravenswood Lakeview Community Collection has a lot of potential for undergraduate researchers. Because of the way the collection was assembled, in many cases, there are only a few documents or at most a few folders about a particular person or location. But I found this can be a good opportunity to do a close analysis of a small number of items without being overwhelmed by many closely related documents. And photographs and ephemera can also serve as great jumping off points for additional research. Sometimes it's possible to use other library and archival researcher resources to really flesh out a story behind an item. And I found this process can be really rewarding. In addition to the photographs and the ephemera, the collection also contains community historical sketches about a number of North Side neighborhoods and reminiscences from former residents. And most of these are several decades old. And while they have valuable local history content, I think looking at them could also be an interesting way to consider how the ways we interpret and remember our past have changed or have not changed over time. Next slide, please. 
The next collection I'd like to share with you all is a Robert W. Kruger photograph collection. Kruger was a local photographer who worked with the library to document the North Side in the late 1980s through the early 2000s. So this is a much more recent collection. The images are mostly made up of places that ordinary people would encounter during their day-to-day -day lives, such as grocery stores, parks, and restaurants. And there's also some images of special events such as festivals and business openings and a few of, excuse me, more well-known North Side landmarks. And one of the things I really like about this collection is the mix of the everyday with the slightly more prominent sites. And I think this collection also has great potential for undergraduate and local history research. A lot of people still living today would definitely recognize many of these places, so I could see it inspiring oral history interviews. It could also inspire a similar photo document documentation project. I would love to see a modern version of this project, what people might choose to capture today. And it also serves frequently as a source for research about businesses and organizations and about how neighborhoods have changed over time. Next slide, please. Finally, I'd like to mention the Portage Park Community Collection. And this is a pretty typical example of one of our smaller neighborhood collections. It contains a small amount of ephemeral publications we'll see from the first half of the 20th century, as well as some images, most of which are from local service organizations during the World War I era. Many of the images in this collection, such as the two you see here, are casual shots of young people in the neighborhood. And I think this is a great reminder, especially for beginning researchers, that archivists are not only interested in documenting the lives of famous and powerful individuals, they're really interested in ordinary people's lives too. So the content varies, but we have similar small collections for several other Northside communities, including Norwood Park, Edison Park, and Logan Square. These community collections are really focused on the first half of the 20th century or earlier, so they could serve as a source to inform historical studies of these neighborhoods. But the lack of more contemporary material is also a great opportunity for us to pursue partnerships and collecting that would also that would ultimately allow us to document more of the North Side. Next slide, please. So moving forward, I think these collections all have a lot to offer researchers, including undergraduates. But we also know they don't fully capture the diversity of the North Side on so many different levels, from its racial diversity to economic diversity, to religious diversity, to diversity of genders and sexualities. So moving forward, we really want to explore ways to pursue partnerships and outreach that might allow us to build relationships and ultimately document more of our neighbors and our neighborhoods. And we know there's a lot of work to do, so it will probably be a slow process, but we're really excited about moving forward. Right now, we're in the beginning of the process of starting up a web archiving program in CPL, at CPL, and we think this has a lot of great potential for documenting our community. And we're also looking forward to reaching out to local cultural organizations and to working with our colleagues in CPL branches to really get to know local communities and ensure their stories are preserved for future generations. Next slide, please. And that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for listening. I'd really love to hear from anyone who's interested in collaborating or has any questions. So here's my contact information. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Michelle. Hello, thanks, Allison. Um, my name is Michelle McCoy, and I'm an archivist at Harold Washington Library Center. Um, we're so pleased that you could join us today for a walk through our neighborhoods. Um, so across the library's three archival locations, we have 140 collections that we specifically categorize as a neighborhood collection. And of course, we have many more collections that we cannot connect to, uh, um, the, connect to neighborhood issues. Um, and there's also several types of neighborhood collections. Um, among these are the personal papers and organizational records that offer a degree of breadth and depth into the life of an individual or the goals and projects of an organization. 
Other collections are made up of club papers, community newspapers, diaries, family histories, historical associations, homeowner associations. And these collections specifically have pockets of historical coverage. Uh, next slide, please. Then we have our community collections. These were first assembled, and Allison spoke a little bit about some of these, um, in the neighborhood library branches. Um, so many of them came to Harold Washington Library Center in the 1980s, and these were reference items that were at these library branches. These collections continue to grow through a mishmash of individual donations and institutional transfers, and occasionally through purchase to fill in those um, diversity gaps. Uh, the community collections are named using the, uh, Chicago's official 77 community areas. Um, these have set boundaries, that's a good thing. As catch-all collections, they are organized by topical areas such as biographical data or transportation or schools and so forth. Next slide, please. The community collections include a full range of material types from the meaty to the ephemeral. So the folder content ranges from brochures, correspondence, flyers, maps, newsletters, pamphlets, photos, etc. Unlike organizational records or personal papers, uh, community collections typically do not have comprehensive coverage of any specific business, religious institution, school, organization, or even some topics, right? Nevertheless, they offer valuable and ever-changing snapshots of Chicago's neighborhoods. And this is especially true when we begin to knit together pieces across the different collections. The most common feedback I receive from instructors and students is that such a vast amount of collections and contents is super exciting, but really very daunting. So how do we begin to introduce these collections with all their strengths and weaknesses? How do we begin to analyze neighborhoods um, with source materials that have arrived by random donations and may be incomplete in coverage and may not reflect the spectrum of diversity of our communities? How do we navigate historic rhetoric with today's keywords? In other words, when is a neighborhood beautification project a tool of segregation and when is it just a garden? How do we begin to remedy these gaps or historical imbalances in available resources? Uh, next slide. So for today's talk, I wanted to share a couple ways I've begun putting together the source material for introductions to diverse groups of teens, college students, and the general public. Uh, for faculty out there, we at the public library will take your course, uh, your class sessions. For this, I, I, I like to start with what I call common experiences. So first we're gonna go back to high school and then we're gonna follow it up with a couple parades. So the four yearbook pages seen here represent four decades of students at Englewood High School. What do they tell us about Englewood? Well, we observe smiling seniors who participated in sports and clubs. We observe a gradual increase in black students and a gradual decline in white students between 1926 and 1951. We observe an integrated high school before there were mandates to desegregate Chicago's schools. Is that right? Curious? Well, the 1948 yearbook offers an intriguing clue. Uh, next slide, please. So pictured among Englewood High School graduates is the playwright Lorraine Hansberry. A decade later, her play, A Raisin in the Sun, debuted on Broadway. This fictional drama about, uh, about housing discrimination and racism on Chicago's South Side has roots in her family's experience. Uh, Chicago's Black population grew by over 200,000 persons between 1900 and 1934. And during this time, most Black residents lived in one of two narrow corridors that stretched south and west from the loop. Uh, this extreme housing consolidation was due in large part to the legally enforceable restrictive covenants written into real estate deeds that stipulated who could reside in a given property and a given neighborhood. Designed primarily to exclude Black tenants and property owners from entering a neighborhood the real estate tool was implemented by neighborhood associations in 85% of Chicago neighborhoods. In 1937, Lorraine's father, Carl Hansberry, purchased a three flat at 6140 South Roads, just south of the Black Belt. The, their residency was immediately challenged by local neighborhood association. Hansberry fought back with the help of the NAACP 
and despite his su Supreme Court victory in 1940, restrictive covenants remained legal. So restrictive covenants used for decades in 85% of Chicago neighborhoods. One might think that we would have several record cartons of these in our collections. Um, this is not the case. In fact, they are a challenge to find. How can that be? Well, I might speculate that for one thing, times change and it's not unthinkable that an organization might later eliminate documents that reflect badly on them. So this is one of the things we need to overcome. The Hansberry experience in this adjacent community of Washington Park, however, provides some insight into what Englewood's transition might have looked like. Next slide. But how does Englewood compare with changing neighborhoods in other regions of Chicago? So let's go across town and see what we can learn from the students at Austin High School on the city's west side about demographic change. So pictured here are yearbooks from 1965 and 1968, a decade packed with social justice actions, including the Chicago Freedom Movement. So unlike the decades of decades long racial shift that occurred in Englewood, Something significant happened in Austin in a three-year period. And we know that the neatly alphabetized senior portraits on this yearbook page, as we learned from Lorraine Hansberry, don't tell the story of interaction. For that, we need to look deeper. Next slide. But yearbooks also show how students participated in regular school activities. Happily, we have a photo of prom attendees taken from the exact same perspective for both years. Unlike 1965, the 1968 photo shows an integrated dance where couples of different races attended the event alongside one another. Today, Austin is a majority black neighborhood. The follow-up questions from these sources might include, what happened to this moment of integrated social interaction? Why was the neighborhood changed so sudden? Why do we assume that change is bad? After decades of restrictions, black residents might have welcomed the change. In fact, Chicago's history is filled with community groups of diverse backgrounds moving from one neighborhood to another. What can we learn about public celebrations of various groups? Next slide. Time for a parade. So let's start with St. Patrick's Day. According to the Chicago Tribune, Chicago's first Irish parade dates back to 1843 and sought to promote their culture in the face of discrimination. Sound familiar? On the left side is, an, is a local Irish parade in East Garfield Park neighborhood, and on the other side is the Central Irish Parade in the Loop 25 years later. Compare the symbolism. One is filled with signs from various ethnic groups and labor leaders and led by a dancing labor leprechaun in overalls. And the other is presumably led by politicians and other important persons in suits, including two members of the Daly family. Today, there are no West Side Irish parades on Madison Street. Residents claiming this heritage and their descendants have long since moved on. In fact, Chicagoans who claim Irish ancestry um, are declining and make up only about 7.5% of Chicago's population today. And this is down from a peak of one third of the populace in the 1890s. Nevertheless, there are still three annual St. Patrick's Day events, the Downtown Parade, the South Side Parade through the Beverly neighborhood, and the Northwest Side Parade through Norwood Park. Next slide. By contrast, persons of Latinx heritage have been steadily increasing over the years and make up almost one third of Chicago's population today. The majority of these residents are Mexican in descent. Parades celebrating Mexican culture have been on the rise since the 1970s. The photos on the right and left show Mexican Independence Day celebrations in South Lawndale, better known as Little Village, and downtown in the Loop. The center image shows a Mexican horseback riders in traditional attire in South Chicago, the neighborhood with the oldest Mexican parish. In contrast to the Irish, neighborhoods like Little Village and Pilsen are defined in part by their Latinx communities. Does our perspective of a group's heritage change when the parade is situated in the heart of an ethnic enclave versus in a more neutral space like the Louvre? And how do these events become part of the conversation of urban diversity? And what does it mean if a parade is, 
is the only view of diversity in a given collection. Today, the 26th Street event is the only Mexican parade. What does that tell us about our social and political structures? Next slide. So all of these questions can be explored further through the hundreds of thousands of sources in our neighborhood collections. Um, for a reading room presentation, I would also display selected documents from these community collections to go with the photos, including sources on urban renewal and school desegregation. I would show examples of neighborhood association meeting minutes, local newsletters, flyers from a few contemporaneous events as a way to discuss context. I would ask attendees to consider the 1962 pamphlet called Look Before You Leave, distributed by the Chicago Commission on Human Relations, and how this relates to high school yearbooks and why it needed to be published. Ultimately, the goal is to show that stories of our neighborhoods and communities manifest in a wide range of regular activities and sources. So as as archivists are actively seeking source material to fill in those gaps and provide a more inclusive picture of Chicago's neighborhoods, we know that this may be challenging when it comes to some of those older sources. In the meantime, we can try to expand on traditional research methods and new ways to use and present the existing source material and, and, and to compare across collections to find some of these um, new ways to present research to our students. So next slide. Uh, bringing everything back full circle, I wanted to leave you with um, a school on parade. <laughs> and now Beth Locke from the Vivian G. Harsh Collection will speak on Chicago's Bronzeville neighborhood. Oh, thank you, Michelle. Uh, the Vivian G. Harsh Research Collection is located at the corner of 95th and Halstead in the Chicago's Washington Heights neighborhood. I believe we're lucky because we have one of the largest parking lots that have any Chicago Public Library location, so we're really easy to, to come and visit. Um, the collection is the largest manuscript collection of African American history in the Midwest, second largest in the United States after the New York Public Library Schomburg research for uh, in Black culture. Our collection seeks to document the Black experience in Chicago and the greater Midwest, although we have a couple of collections that are national in, in focus. Our collection consists of over 70,000 reference books. Many of them are rare. Um, it also consists of about 500 magazine and journal, journal titles, current and retrospective, 75 microfilm research collections, which equals over 7,000 reels. However, the most unique materials at the Harsh Research Collection are its nearly 250 archival collections documenting African-American individuals and organizations. Um, and these Black history collections cover a multitude of subject areas. Today, I'll highlight our archival collections that are especially useful in documenting Chicago's Brownsville neighborhood. St. Clair Drake and Horace Caton wrote in their book, Black Metropolis, uh, that Chicago's Brownsville city was a, was a city within a city and the second largest African-American city in the world in the 1940s. Geographically, the neighborhood boundaries extend from 22nd Street on the north to 63rd Street on the south, Cottage Grove on the east to Wentworth Avenue on the west. These boundaries were fixed with a restrictive housing covenant and enforced by neighboring white residents intimidation and violence. On the right, you'll see a map of terrorist attacks against Negro homes in Chicago, um, from 44 to 1946, um, and this is from the Hall Branch archives. The Great Migration, when African Americans left the South and other uh, left the South for Chicago and other northern cities with the promise of better jobs and reduced oppression, began around 1915. This migration caused a number of Bronzeville residents to soar. Chicago attracted slightly more than 500,000 of the approximately 7 million African Americans who fled the South. The Black Chicago Renaissance, also known as the Chicago Black Renaissance, was a creative movement of artists, writers, musicians, and knowledge that blossomed out of the Chicago's Brownsville neighborhood in the 1930s and 40s. Um, a notable Brownsville uh, resident, Dr. Tenniel Black Jr was part of the Great Migration. He was born in Birmingham, Alabama in December, 1918, 
and his family moved to Chicago when he was less than a year old. Tim Black was a high school teacher, college professor, political and civil rights activist, author, and historian. He worked on the Black Metropolis Oral History Project for more than 10 years. The project had three components, oral history interviews of more than 100 residents who lived in Bronzeville from 1915 to 1950, his own uh, autobiography, and two books documenting Bronzeville and the Great Migration. Tim Black donated this collection to the Harsh Research collection almost 20 years ago. It includes recordings and transcripts of his oral history interviews and his general research for his manuscripts. His personal photographs, school records, correspondence, and work history document a life in Bronzeville. Um, you might have heard recently in the news that Dr. <clears throat> Black passed away on Wednesday at age 102. So he lived in Bronzeville for um, over 101 years. Um, and so he was truly a Chicago treasure. He used to tell the story about how he was born in Alabama. He looked around at the conditions in the South, said, I'm getting out of here to his parents and that they could follow him North if they wanted to. So that kind of just shows his wit and his humor. And uh, we've had a few researchers that said you can't document Black history in Chicago without diving into Timuel Black's papers. It's a great way to get a firsthand account from uh, the residents of Bronzeville. All right, I'd like to give a, an overview of a few of the institutions of the Bronzeville uh, community, starting with the George Cleveland Hall branch. In January, 1932, the George Cleveland Hall branch of Chicago Public Library opened at 48th Street and Michigan Avenue. Um, and it was the first full service library started for diverse and, and the, the, the diverse and growing black population on the South Side. The previous summer, the Chicago Defender newspaper announced that a Miss Vivian G. Harsh, uh, with 20 years experience and one of the best informed librarians of the city was named librarian in charge, which was a great honor. She was the first African-American branch head at any Chicago Public Library location. She had graduated from Wendell Phillips High School and by 1921, Harsh had also graduated from library school in Boston and accepted the position at the, Harsh, at the Cleveland Hall branch in 1932. Vivian Gordon Harsh managed the library with help from the Children's Library and Charlemagne Hill Raleigh. Um, who worked tirelessly through the 1930s um, for the children's department. She performed the ordinary duties of a librarian and worked tirelessly uh, as a gifted storyteller who could memorize children with tales of Black history and literature. Rollins clipped newspaper and magazine articles that highlighted the contributions of African Americans. She did book reviews and book selections and ran workshops for parents. In this photo, you can see Ms. Vivian Harsh pictured front and center um, on opening day at the George Cleveland Hall branch. This is her sitting in her office at the library and behind her is the special Negro collection. Um, over time and with keen insight, Vivian Harsh collected rare books, pamphlets, and materials that documented the African-American experience. Funding for her special Negro collection um, came from grants patron donations, and she also used her own money to purchase these books for the collection. In the 1930s, the collection's reputation spread and the library became a meeting place for promising young black writers, artists, and activists. When the WPA's Federal Writers Project was shut down, the director of the Negro and Illinois Project donated over a hundred boxes of research materials to Harsh. Langston Hughes donated the manuscripts and galley proofs for his biography, The Big C. Uh, scholars and neighborhood folk mingled at the library's bi-monthly book review and lecture forums, which hosted such speakers as Richard Wright, Zora Neale Hurston, Gwendolyn Brooks, Alan Locke, Horace Hayton, and St. Clair Drake. Her collection was a success and grew into one of the largest collections um, in the United States. Sadly, Vivian Harsh passed away in August, 1960, and 10 years later, her special Negro collection was renamed in her honor and moved to the Carter G. Woodson Regional Library. The Harsh Research Collection also holds the papers of William McBride, 
McBride was an early participant in the effort to establish the Southside Community Art Center. Um, initially, this movement considered the dialogue between younger artists, such as McBride and Margaret Taylor Goss Burroughs. The initial organization was brought together at the Southside Settlement House by George Thorpe, director of the Illinois Art Project, and Peter Polak, owner of the Chicago Artists Group Gallery on Michigan Avenue, one of the few places where Black artists were allowed to exhibit their artwork. The mission of the Southside Community Arts Center was proclaimed by Margaret Burroughs as the defense of culture. One of many inner city community art centers established by the Federal Art Project the work progress in the administration, the center moved into an old mansion at 3831 South Michigan Avenue in 1940. However, the library, the first exhibition was held in later that year when it was formally dedicated by First Lady uh, Eleanor Roosevelt at a ceremony chaired by Alan Locke. The Federal Art Project withdrew funding in mid-1942, but the Southside Community Center thrived. It proved an immediate success. In its first four months, it drew 7,800 attendees to classes and its first four exhibitions. It provided a space for young artists honing their skills, such as William McBride, Margaret Burroughs, Charles White, and Charles Seabree. And those artists got to interact with established Black Chicago masters, such as Archibald Motley Jr. and William Edward Scott. The center also organized art programs for Southside community youth who only had half day shifts at an overcrowded segregated schools. In addition, this, the center ran a theater troupe, the Chicago Negro Art Theater, which nurtured the talents of Gwendolyn Brooks and Margaret Danner. Um, here we have a picture, which is actually from the Perkins papers, the Marion Perkins papers. And this is just a really great example of a Black Chicago Renaissance gathering with um, some of the prominent names from that time period in Bronzeville. Um, William McBride, whose papers I was talking about a minute ago, he, his most celebrated work for the center was his overseeing the design of the souvenir books and the posters for the Art Center's annual Artists and Models Ball, uh, which was their fundraising gala. And it quickly became a marquee event on the Bronzeville calendar. McBride also composed um, several Christmas cards for Nelson Sykes Brass Rail Tavern nearby. He became a painter of local renown in the 1940s. Today, the Southside Community Art Center remains the only surviving community art center created under the WPA. Provident Hospital, um, which is now a public hospital, was the first African-American owned and operated hospital in America. It was also the first hospital to establish a nursing school for African-American women. Provident was established in Chicago in 1891 by Dr. Daniel Hill Williams, an African-American surgeon during the time um, in American history where few public or private medical facilities were open to Black Americans. The first location was a three-story brick house at 29th and Dearborn. Dr. George Cleveland Hall became chief of staff in 1926 he played a major role in expanding healthcare to Bronzeville resident uh, Southern, the residents in the South. In the 1930s, Provident Hospital spearheaded widespread community outreach, focusing on issues such as inadequate housing, education, and food. So the Harsh Research Collection holds several collections regarding Provident Hospital, including the papers of Dr. Leonidas Berry. In 1934, he became a junior attending physician in gastroenterology at Chicago's Provident Hospital. One year after his appointment, Dr. Berry became the chairman of the hospital's uh, division of gastroenterology, and he held this position until 1970. At Provident, Dr. Berry was also the chairman for the Department of Medicine from 1947 to 49, and a senior attending physician from 63 to 1980. Dr. Berry's archival collection documents the history of Provident Hospital, its closing and its reopening as a unit of Cook County Hospital. Um, it includes correspondence, meeting minutes, uh, reports, research proposals, and clippings. There are several collections at Harsh that deal with uh, nurses who trained and worked at Provident Hospital and the papers of Dr. Ulysses Grant Daly as well, 
but I really think that um, Dr. Berry's collection gives the best overview of Providence history. Providence, um, I'm sorry, Bronzeville had hundreds of churches, if not thousands of them over this 50 year time span. Um, two that I wanna discuss really quickly that are well-documented at the Hirsch Research Collection um, are the Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church. We hold their archives here. And then also All Nations Pentecostal Church, um, which was founded by Lucy Smith. And we do have the Lucy Smith Foyer papers here at Hirsch as well. Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church was founded in June 1902 when a disagreement arose in Olivet Missionary Baptist Church, Chicago's oldest African-American Baptist Church, over the purchase of property. The, dis the dispute split Olivet into two factions. One faction remained at Olivet, the other a small determined group of about 30 parishioners led by Olivet's former pastor, the Reverend J.F. Thomas, left Olivet and established Ebenezer Baptist Church, Missionary Baptist Church. Um, Ebenezer was first located in Arlington Hall at 31st Street in Indiana Avenue, but after a year of worship, um, it became too small and they moved, they purchased the building at 35th and Dearborn Street for just over 11,000. Um, Reverend Thomas, who spent 18 years at Ebenezer, um, also served as president of the Illinois State Baptist Convention and as chaplain of the famed 8th Regiment of the U.S. Army. Under his leadership, the church prospered and membership continued to grow. And it again found itself for a need for a larger building. So in 1920, Thomas and the Ebenezer Church met with Isaiah Temple um, and finalized plans to purchase the synagogue at 45th Street in Vincennes. And this building continues to be the home of Ebenezer Missionary Baptist Church. The legendary Theodore Fry served as music director and Professor Thomas A. Dorsey as pianist. In January 1932, um, after only a month of rehearsals, the Ebenezer Gospel Choir made its debut and a church filled to capacity. The 100 member chorus wowed the congregation with their soulful, Southern influenced spiritual sound. And then six weeks later, they made their first public appearance. Um, outside of the church. Dorsey left Ebenezer to direct a new gospel choir at Pilgrim Baptist Church. And in spite of this loss, Ebenezer gospel choir continued to prosper under Fry's leadership. Roberta Martin uh, was also at the church. She was chosen to replace Dorsey as pianist. Um, while at Ebenezer, she organized the Roberta Martin singers, originally six young men from the choirs at Ebenezer and Pilgrim. Each of the members of the group went on to renown gospel solos. Um, the Great Migration influenced membership of the church um, and many of the new migrants got ties to um, their families, friends, and communities they knew in the South. So Ebenezer responded with um, a number of state clubs. So they could belong to the Tennessee Circle or they could belong to um, some of the the other clubs that they had for Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, all numbers of state clubs where people could feel connected to where they had come up from. Um, all right, All Nations Pentecostal Church. So Reverend uh, Lucy Smith was a Baptist since the age of 12, and she was first affiliated with Olivet Baptist Church and then briefly with Ebenezer. But in 1912, she left the Baptist space altogether and became um, a faith healer. She sensed a call to start her own ministry and um, formed a small prayer band in 1916 with two other women in her home on Langley Avenue, from which grew the Langley Avenue All Nations Pentecostal Church in 1918. It was a tent mission church and it moved around quite a bit until they got their own building in the 1920s. Um, and in December 1926, All Nations began to worship at a building at 3716 Langley Avenue. Um, it was the first church ever built by a woman pastor in Chicago and the first new construction of a church building by African Americans in over two decades. With the help of her small band of saints, by the 1930s, the church grew astronomically, um, having as many as 5,000 members. And it was a legend on the South Side. Smith was known for being a faith healer who claimed to have healed over 200,000 people. Their outreach was amazing during the Great Depression 
They served uh, numerous groups on Chicago's South Side in Bronzeville, helping out with uh, food and providing housing for people. All Nations was especially known for its spectacular gospel music, which could be heard at the church or on radio broadcast programs, which began in the 1933, called the Glorious Church of the Air. So that's just a little bit <laughs> about two collections that we have at Harsh. I don't want to talk too much, but uh, these were some of the many, many collections that I mentioned, and there are many more that do document uh, Bronzeville community. A few of these collections have been digitized by Chicago Public Library, including the Illinois Writers Project and the Bureau in Illinois collection, Tim Black's papers, the George Cleveland Hall branch, and um, a few images from the Chicago Renaissance. Um, collections that are spread out um, and mentioned here. So if you're interested in any of them, you can jot down the names. And of course, we are open by appointment, Mondays through Thursdays and on Saturdays. Um, go ahead and give us a call or shoot us an email and we'll be happy to talk with you. And here's the contact information for all of today's speakers. Please give us a call. Contact us if you have any questions about any of the archival collections or history subjects that we mentioned today. Thank you. Thank you, Beth, and thank you, Michelle and Allison. That was a really fascinating um, presentation. Sorry if any of you were stuck in the waiting room while I was staring at the pictures and ignoring the <laughs> participant list. Um, I felt those um, archival, uh, those yearbook photos, and there just seemed to be so many stories in those yearbook photos. That was a really interesting um, that Michelle showed. So if anybody has questions, we have a little bit of time for questions. You're welcome to put them into the chat and um, I'll try to, to read them out or, or call you out to, to ask your question. Um, but we welcome your questions now. Um, oh, and we maybe have one that just came up. Um, so do any of the CPL special collection archive branches um, focus specifically on the history um, and preservation of Latinx um, material. Um, you know, something similar, Beth, to what you were talking about for the African-American um, community that you have at the Vivian Harsh Center. Um, I can kind of jump in. Um, at this time, we do not have um, as many resources in that area as we'd like to. This is an area where we have been in conversation with different folks and um, actively looking to acquire. Um, I do know that um, uh, DePaul with the Center for um, Latino Studies and UIC have pretty robust um, Latinx collections already. Um, there's certainly uh, many more stories in the city to be told and that is definitely something that um, we have been thinking about. And yeah, it's um, unfortunate that we don't have more. Do you have relationships with like the community history organizations or that, that exist or is there kind of any formal connections there? Or? So they're, they're really, um, some of our branch libraries do, right? Okay. Um, and so that's, um, I've been um, having lots and lots of conversations with, um, the, you know, the director of the Lozano branch library about um, some of the groups and organizations that they work with at that branch. And so I think these are things that we're trying to like think through and develop and, yeah. and, um, and develop those relationships and see where these folks want to go, you know, and, and a lot of communities too um, want to keep their own materials. So it's how do you sort of work with these communities um, on the level they want to work at? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Crystal, for asking that question. Um, there are other questions. Beth, I was just curious if you had any examples of collaborating with a class or students, either at the college level or even at the high school level, um, and maybe you know any lessons learned or just, an ex it's always interesting to hear an example of a success story or so. Yeah, absolutely. From 2018 to 2019, we were lucky to host um, a large exhibit on the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. And we worked directly with former members of the, the Black Panthers who donated or, or loaned their materials for the exhibit. And there was a lot of interest from the Metro History Fair students, um, both 
high school students and um, college students, undergrads on the topic. And so what we were able to do was uh, pair them up with former members of the who could and they could actually do the interviews themselves we kind of just acted as an intermediary or you know pre-pandemic we were allowed to have them come in and give exhibit tours and rather than me speaking the whole time we actually invited former members of the black panthers to come in and tell their their stories themselves and they got to hmm. meet the students so that was a wonderful partnership through that exhibit and it's of course always best when you can hear history from the people who lived it rather than via an archivist, although I love talking about it as well. Yeah. But that was that was a really nice exhibit and we offered some good programming. We were very, very lucky to to um, partner with the former members of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. Yeah, I mean, and that's part of the, the inspiration for this whole day really is thinking about how do we get our students connected to primary sources and you know connecting to the actual artifacts. It's just so powerful. And then when you are a bridge to the actual individuals who live these live these lives, in some cases maybe founded these organizations, or that's it just seems like a really transformative experience for a student to have that experience. So we do have one more or another question in chat. Others are welcome. What is the best resource for Lincoln Square research? Um, I guess it would depend what time period they were interested in, but probably the Ravens of Lakeview Community Collection has quite a bit of material. And the Robert Kruger Photograph Collection also has more modern images. And as, as an archivist, would you have any advice, Allison? You know, if a student comes to me and I'm, I'm interested in the history of Lincoln Square, it's a pretty broad question, maybe you know, helping them think about, you know, setting them up for more maybe success using primary sources, how we might help them refine that a little bit. <clears throat> yeah, that would definitely, I think narrowing down topics is, often challenging in the work I've done with students. But yeah, I guess I would maybe encourage them to think about what their interests are. Like, are they interested in theater? Maybe they want to look at theater. Maybe they want to look at, I don't know, a particular, maybe they like music kind of, or maybe there's a particular issue in the news that's been coming up a lot that they feel passionately about and they want to research the history of that. So I guess that's how I would guide them to kind of look at their own interests and narrow it down that way. Yeah. So well, I think we're we're about out of time. So I think we're going to let wrap it up there. But thank you once again to our panelists, Allison and Michelle and Beth. And I mean, I think one thing I've taken away from this is just what a resource these archivists are and you know to, to pick their brain and if we have those students are thinking about a class. Um, you know that they would bring a wealth of knowledge just from their hands on experience with these collections so um, so thank you all. Um, if you would like to participate and we hope you would in further Chicago research summit material, you can go to the program page of the website and you can find future you know the links for the. Uh, 11, or the 10 o'clock sessions, there will be four new sessions starting at 10 o'clock and you can find those links there. I just posted the link in the chat to our program page. So, um, all right, well, thank you all. Have a good day. Um, I'm gonna be ending the recording and then we will be wrapping up this Zoom session.